that one. Um, so there's one of the flyers that he has um, used. And I can make these slides available in the chat for anybody afterwards. And the public presentations, quite large scale over there in the United States. And try to um, create a path from renter to owner. We'll talk a bit more about that later. And the ideal members being young families and seniors as well, co-housing communities being a high functioning functioning community, so it's really great for seniors and first-time buyers. And members must have skin in the game and no absentee owners. It's not a place for batches. So I've pulled this from a co-housing community that is starting up in Whangarei called Ahiwai. And I think this is quite a common um, communication system. We're looking at group communications here. So they use the colored card system, which they might have got from Earthsong, um, which is quite a bit of a fuffle when you use it, but it does stop um, everybody talking at once and it provides some sort of order to the, um, to the group meetings. So it's also important to develop people's and teams' ability to make smart decisions and create a safe place of mutual respect where nobody needs to worry about being heard. And, um, do lots of drilling down and research and have a dispute resolution, restoration, restorative conversation system for when you run into sort of communication, social difficulties. And now uh, moving on to um, the group structure. I'm a little bit slide ahead there. Um, Charles reckoned, I mean, he, he specialised in kind of helping co-housing groups come together and that the bottom-up approach was best for co-housing. Um, but that the, the, the group could find a kind of core group who had the skills to take on a leadership role and uh, could act with good judgment and had lots of charisma. And good facilitators are really um, a great asset to any co-housing group. They really bring out the best in the group. And becoming a corporation, a legal entity, some sort of body corporate or community trust ownership is very important, especially in terms of affordability. Um, and it's quite a tricky area, especially in New Zealand, where you want to have the, the collective body savings that you can make as a, as a single entity. But you also want to be able to um, allow banks to give you mortgaging, financing, finance, um, and therefore you have to have your own separate little stake that the banks will bank on. So, you know, there's, there's kind of pros and cons to all of that or, or issues. So finding a site. So um, once the group has grown, Charles reckoned that that was the time to find a site and he thinks 10 units per acre which would be about 400 meters, 400 square meters per unit. And he suggested asking councils for unused land that they have, looking for distress sites, which are opportunities, um, looking on the fringe of town. And this is a site here that I've identified on the fringe of Waipu, which is a little bit distressed in that it's next to a timber mill. So there's um, a bit of noise and dust pollution but because of that it is very affordable and um, you know there's lots of opportunities it's ideal and that it's quite close to town um, and then asking developers it's another way of um, sites that they're not using and use google maps to um, look for uh, here we go uh, and GIST maps, I don't know if anybody knows what a GIST map is, but it, it's, it's kind of like the council's version of a Google map. And it also gives you um, the zoning for each area. So it's very hard to change any zoning of land in New Zealand. Um, so that's why, you know, when you're kind of looking on this on the fringes of town, like the site that I've showed you before, that sh um, is actually farmland, but it's zoned for residential. You can develop it down to 500 square meters. Um, 
Another way is to look for old factories. Um, and co-housing can really transform ugly urban sites. Um, as you see with this, so this is the design that Charles came up with with uh, a factory. And you can see in the series of slides that's it being developed. So they've basically put houses on top of the old factory and created this really nice environment with the rooftop gardens. Um, so they've really transformed the urban environment there. Um, churches are another um, potential site, especially in New Zealand, where we are so secular. And if a church goes beneath, uh, the congregation goes beneath 22 people, then it becomes economically unviable. And there's an opportunity there to buy that land. And they usually have car parks and other areas. Um, so, you know, that's a, something to look out for. Um, abandoned streets, you can make the council an offer. Um, and if you need to rezone, or if you're going to try and rezone an area, it's a good idea to take the, the whole group along to appeal to the council and offer to provide social services like putting people back in bed, seniors, and talk to the council about the benefits and the, de the development would bring to the community. And never take no um, for the first answer from the council. Always kind of go back at them and be very community focused. And once you find an off, uh, a site, put an offer on it, on a refundable deposit, set a timeline, and then do your feasibility study. And that's where you look at the due diligence, cover everything, the toxins, the access from the road, connections to the infrastructure, transport, wetlands, boundaries, examine all the realities so the prices are as realistic as possible. Okay, moving on to getting it built. And this is basically where you organize a meeting and that's where members get very focused and you lay it all out on the table, have big binders, whiteboards, and consider everything and be very decisive. Um, Chuck talked about designing uh, a dwelling in four hours and that's it, it's sort of, you're done, you don't go back to it. And it's a good way of developing the co cohesion of the group and emotional ownership. And doing deals with developers can also be a, a good way of um, developing the site as they have the money, the knowledge, the workers and the marketing. But of course, it will come at some sort of cost, uh, profit share or whatever. Um, the average co-housing uh, development takes seven years. And there's an example of an American common house, quite different to how's in New Zealand, kind of a much larger scale, really. Everything's bigger over there, including the fridges. Okay, so moving on to consultants. Consultants really have to be in tune with co-housing and the project manager is an absolute key to success. The main reason co-housing projects fail is due to delay. So the project management is actually very hard to do. It must be a dedicated professional who's working on the site at least 50% of the time, can't be a sort of amateur member of the group. And a good project manager, manager can only do 85% of the job. So they need to have a good team around them and know their limitations. So that's something for the group to suss out. And a story from that is that um, up in Akiwa and, and Whangarei, this development, I think they've been through I think they're on the ninth project manager for the job. Um, and it's been going about five years. They haven't put a spade in the ground yet. So it just shows you how difficult it is. Okay, so moving on to the design and construction affordable tips. Okay, so make the construction documents as explicit as possible, down to every nail and screw. And this takes longer, but it's much easier to bid on. Less contingency in the quotes, that's where you're kind of adding a kind of what if factor. 
uh, just in case and padding out the quote. Uh, so there's no surprises, no unknowns, and no under-considering. Yeah, so that's a, a really important one and probably a good one for an architect to say because it's kind of more work for him, but ultimately it should save everybody more money. Um, and Charles is really big on no lintels um, above the windows. I guess not everybody knows what a lintel is, which is basically the beam you have above a, lind uh, a window or a door that supports the walls above the door or the window. And it's usually a big chunky piece of wood. I can't actually see any in that picture, but um, it's very expensive to put them in and to do all the bracketing and bracing and calculations and design of them. Um, so it makes sense just to take the windows up to the full stud height and you get more light like that as well. So you save money. Um, and contracts are really important. I actually haven't got a picture of a contract, um, not surprisingly, because they're not very exciting to look at. Um, but, you know, that's, that's where you really want to have your good negotiators to get the best contract for you. And particularly with the procurement, that's buying all the building materials. Um, if you can do a contract where you can get that yourselves, you avoid a 20% markup from the main contractor. So every piece of material he'll buy, he'll add 20% to it. And um, depending on the contract, you can save a lot of money on um, if the members, it sounds a bit silly, but if the members do all the sweeping and tidying on the building site, uh, that will save thousands of dollars because basically everybody drops tools half an hour before they finish and, um, you know, they, they tidy everything away. And, you know, if you've got some key members that can do that um, and also be the gophers. So, you know, if they need a bag of screws or a piece of ply or a jib board, if you've got somebody um, who can go off and get that, that's going to save a lot of time and a lot of money. But it's obviously only going to be worth it if you're on a hourly rate as opposed to all in contract. It's really important, those contracts for saving money. And having good acoustic insta ins insulation in party walls. I mean, I guess speaking from, um, Charles would have been speaking from experience here, you know, if you don't get those uh, party walls, the separation right, it's, it's not such an attractive place to live. And, you know, you won't, um, you know, it's, it's not, not going to be such a, a pleasant place to live or such a good value in there. Okay, so moving on. Um, now, living in co-housing saves a lot of money. This is an American model. And they kind of averaged out somewhere between $2,500 on each co-housing that they, um, they did the sums on and Zola has a graphic here that you gave me just before we started and I haven't really studied but there is a lot of opportunity for saving money I mean the first thing is if you're building a house um, you don't need a spare bedroom for visitors because they can stay in the common house so obviously that reduces your construction costs considerably um, and the shared laundry, the shared lawnmower, and the shared electricity bill. So up in Ahiwai, we've had a big issue with North Power wanting to supply um, the 17 units, and they wanted 17 different electrical connections. And that's one of the huge savings with Earthsong. I think their average electricity bill per house is something like $30 as opposed to mine's about 200 and that's because they're getting it at a wholesale rate and they're distributing it themselves um, but North Power fought tooth and nail to um, resist letting them have um, one connection that they would then spread out to everybody else and they had to use actually the project manager nepotism he knew somebody high up in North Power and Northland 
and manage to get them to relent and uh, let them have one three-phase connection that they could then split off to everybody else. So big saving there in the long term. Okay, so moving on to affordable housing, what we're all um, interested in. So there is really no super duper trick to making affordable housing. The most important thing is having a really clear commitment to the building affordable. And to do that, the co-housing group must have people on the cusp, on the breadline, on the board, involved in the decision-making process. Um, so there's lots of small steps that make the difference. Lots of Ds, actually. So be creative, have vision, and make definitive steps. Be disciplined and deliberate to reduce costs. Um, I mean, the, the inverse is kind of more true here. If you're a bit fluffy and a bit undecided and you kind of can't quite get clear, the price is just going to go up, especially if you don't kind of get it together early on in the design process or, heaven forbid, you start making changes in the construction process, the price is just going to go through the roof. Um, so, you know, that's why it's not so much making a project affordable, it's making, avoiding kind of the traps. And Charles didn't, he talked about this in a kind of the inverse way. He said, be really disciplined and deliberate with everything you do. Play the planning and construction process like a chess game. Um, so it's, a, it's a, avoiding kind of muck-ups and uh, which just costs so much money. And I could tell you a story about that, but I won't. <laughs> um, so keeping everything uniform is more economical, as in repeating the dwelling designs which saves lots of money, both at the concept design stage and the design document and the, the construction. So obviously you're only producing, you know, reproducing design documents and with the construction, there's gonna be less waste and the builders don't have to figure it out five times how to do something. And also having small sections. Um, let me just whiz through, um, here we go. So this is a design that I've come up with, which is really ergonomic. So it's basically a section on, uh, including the yard on about 90 square meters, 96 square meters, I think it is. Um, so small, simple houses and ergonomic design. And in a sense, because you've got your common ground and your common house, you don't have to have a big yard you know you've kind of got that outside so that's a way you can save money um, and there's an opportunity there with um, bigger houses kind of subsidizing smaller houses but i'll come back to that in a minute so in new zealand as in america timber framing is very low risk and very sustainable so kind of affordable it's more affordable than other construction methods. And the co-housing group can save money during their own marketing. And um, there's obviously lots of books to look at like that. Charles suggested guerrilla marketing book. And having a commercial aspect to a co-housing um, group can save uh, a lot of money in the long run, as in it'll offset the costs and will provide a future income. So the houses here and this one are above the shops. Um, having expensive units to the outside to subsidize the affordable units um, is a good way of bringing more diversity and obviously making it more affordable for the smaller ones. Here's an Australian model, which has very swanky houses with larger sections on the outer rim of the um, the development and as they get smaller and closer to the common house they're you know more affordable and that brings a really good diversity to a um, co-housing group which i think is one of the most 
um, essential ingredients that's been identified in Denmark and places like that for success to have diversity. Um, so recycling can save a lot of money. So here's an example of a $500 kitchen from a house I built. So all of those benches, the cooker, the, the sink, um, all of the units there, um, they cost 500 bucks. Yeah, from I had to go to another house on Trade Me and take apart that kitchen and cart it all the way up to Waipu and rebuild it. So it did cost a bit more in uh, blood, sweat and tears, but compared to spending, I don't know, 20, 30 grand on a kitchen, it can be a great way of saving a lot of money. And on the back of that, you know, you can you can actually get a whole new house. I mean, a whole second-hand house. And that's a, a good way of, it's one of the cheapest ways of getting a property, but uh, I mean, of getting a home. But obviously there can be issues with um, maintenance and the living costs can be more if you don't have really good insulation. So it might be a matter of taking off all the jib walls and putting in decent insulation. Right, I've just lost my place here. Are there any questions while I kind of find where I'm up to? I'm actually going quite fast. So we're racing through the, uh, the time here. So we'll come back to your um, graphic to Zola about stuff. Okay. So another good way is finding local materials. So this is an example of um, newspaper cellular insulation. So that's newspapers created into kind of mixed with them, some sort of glue, I guess, and then blown into walls. Very inexpensive, but probably highly efficient insulation. And saying that you can also, it's also worth looking at the site and finding out what local um, materials and resources would be available. It might be really good clay for building um, adobe houses, or it might be possible to grow hemp or bamboo on the site or nearby um, as a way of, you know, using what's local, and that's a good way to keep the um, keep it eco-friendly as well. So, yeah, once again, the big tip having really good negotiators among your group and making really good contracts. Um, and also looking for funders um, and grants for nonprofit development. And this can add a layer of complexity to a co-housing development. It can make it take much longer and it can mean there'll be certain strings attached, but there's also great opportunities. And we were just talking about this before with uh, CHIPS community, um, what are they? Community housing providers. Mm -hmm. I'm missing out a letter there. Um, and it, it might be possible in New Zealand, uh, we need to explore this a bit more to kind of do a splice between your co-housing group and a community housing provider. But uh, I asked Charles Durrett about this and he said it, it can end up with um, a bit of social friction in that, say you've got Oranga Tamariki um, coming in and providing housing for needy people. It might be that they're not interested in contributing to the co-housing ethos or getting involved in the gardens or the co or the common house. And that can provide a lot of friction that he's found in the United States. Um, so it's better to have everybody on the same page, really. Um, and he also suggested doing lots of spreadsheets and on the cost benefit analysis of different types of building and materials and really drilling down and, and working out, you know, the best way to go. And stay away from cheap windows. That's not a good idea. Or cheap materials generally, like, um, I mean, windows, for instance, you know, a lot of materials are only guaranteed for five years. So you can imagine, you know, the cost of putting in a, another set of aluminium windows after five years, you'd be pretty upset. And obviously 
borrowing money costs a lot. You know, it actually doubles the cost of, uh, of your house in the long run. So if you can reduce those borrowing um, costs, it's, it's a great idea. And the final kind of quote I've got from Charles Jurek is the play pays to be very deliberate about everything with members and with consultants. That's the big affordable tip. Okay, gosh, I raced through that 10 hours into about 40 minutes. <laughs> Peter, what did, you, what did you say? What was the last um, advice? Mm. It pays to be very deliberate about everything. What does Both it mean? With, it means... Um, It means not to be kind of airy-fairy or fluffy. It, it means to know exactly what you want, what direction you want, how you want to do it. So during the research um, and going for it, yeah. So it's not relying on the consultant or the architect to kind of advise you on um, the best material or... You know, it's actually doing the research yourself and having as clear an idea of the size of the dwellings and the number of dwellings and all of this stuff, knowing your development as well as you possibly can and being very, very clear with your communication with your members and with your consultants. Okay, uh, there you. is the last slide. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? I had a question about um, building with air crete. That, is, that should be quite a cheaper way to build, would it be? Um, I presume, are you talking about concrete with mixed with air? Yeah, so it's yeah. it's a lot lighter and yeah, yeah, warmer. and it's got a thermal properties. Yeah, I'm not sure about the cost of it because of that extra processing. It um, would probably cost more than concrete, I imagine. Um, so you're using also, a lot less material. Yeah, you'll be using less material, but there's a the aeration of the concrete in mm. itself would kind of add to it mm. and you're still using concrete which is environmentally uh has the highest mm. um co2 emissions i think for any product well one of the highest well hempcrete is obviously a, a great idea and uh, there are a few places being built with hempcrete around but i wonder if that industry is going to take off or i mean it needs to it seems to me it's a no-brainer for new zealand I'm totally with you there, uh, Martin. I mean, I'm you know, I've been the knee to him. It is just the most amazing plant and the most amazing building material. And I think you mm. only need four hectares of hemp to build a, a dwelling. So, mm. but the, the problem is in New Zealand, we're a bit behind. I mean, the whole world is behind because of the cannabis yeah. prohibition. Um, mm -hmm. But in New Zealand particularly, we haven't got very good um, processing. Hemp is so strong mm -hmm. that the average combine harvester can't cope with it. It destroys them. Mm. Mm. So, you know, there's only a few really good um, uh, processing machines in New Zealand that mm. can um, deal with the hemp. But it, it does, you're right, it does need to develop more. Kia ora Peter, uh, kia ora koutou everybody else. Um, my, name's, my name's Jeremy, um, I'm a builder and um, been interested in co-housing for a while and I wanted to try and clarify something in my head about the different types of affordability, that the different ways to sort of categorise the affordability because it sounds like you've got affordability of um, doing your design and democracy process as streamlined as possible so that you're not spending time and effort changing your mind you've got yep. you've got trying to achieve the lowest 
external costs as possible. So that's the legislation, that's the cost of borrowing and things like that. And then you've got what we're talking about here, which is the cost of materials and the build process. And for instance, using things like free labor to make it more affordable by, you know, mucking in um, as the group. I was wondering, because the housing industry is already trying to find the cheapest way to build from the materials side of things, what are the best ways to afford better affordability on the cost of land, cost of borrowing and cost of legislation side of things, which seems to be this big hump that groups fail to get over. And it's probably one of the first humps because you can have a group, but unless you have the land and a, and a plan, it doesn't come to fruition. I mean, one of the first things is not to be treated as a developer. And so that way you can reduce your development contributions and that can save you something like $13,000, $17,000 per section. So it's, it's quite difficult to do. I think the co-housing group in Wellington, which was, I can't remember the name of them now, um, I think they brought one big section and they've made four or five apartments from it. And they struggled for ages to convince Wellington Council that they were not a development and thereby reducing the development costs. Um, and as you know, Jeremy, you know, when you put kind of fiddly bits and extra corners and um, so on and, and houses, the cost just goes up. So, you know, that's a, a big saving there by the simplicity of the design and the simplicity of the construction. Yeah, that you didn't mention. Does that answer your question? Was there anything else? I take it there are no um, tips and tricks to getting land at below market value? <laughs> uh, well, the distressed sites thing, you know, mm -hmm. where you, you buy a site that... Um, like this one that I'm looking at is next to an industrial facility. And, you know, nobody really wants to build there because it's a bit noisy. So my intention is to develop some affordable housing that would, for workers' accommodation at the industrial site. So they're probably not gonna mind so much and make terraced houses that would block out the noise as well as mitigate this, the source of the noises um, by putting an extra uh, installation at the industrial facility. Um, and there's, you know, sites that um, have toxins in them, uh, like from orchards or something and all the spraying that they did. So, you know, it's very difficult to build there because the council won't let you because, of the, you know, you have to take away the meat of the topsoil. But if you had the time, you could plant hemp, for instance, um, and that sucks out all the heavy metals and all the toxins out of the soil. And therefore, mm -hmm. you would alleviate that problem and you would create a building material. Um, so, you know, those are the, the kind of ways to do it, you know, to buy the, the less desirable land. And of course, you know, the smaller sections. Have a tendency in New Zealand to build build bigger and bigger houses, as you probably know, in bigger sections. So, I think affordability starts with the land, and the land also can be subsidised through these community housing developments. You know, where you can appeal to various government agencies or NGOs to. Um, subsidize the cost of the land for the sort of social benefits that are um, that are you know available that come from development doing a co-housing development um, but that takes longer but you know if you've got the time and you, it's worth making the effort um, it's worth exploring those options Yeah, I think that's where, um, leading on from what you were saying, Peter, is in terms of being able to leverage the benefit that can be shown that this um, 
a development or project is doing is that um, if one can align it with the benefit that the local region has already identified that they want to uh, be able to uh, create and then you align the mission of the community with some of those objectives. So for instance, carbon um, sequestration or carbon neutrality, if the one of the ways, uh, one of the values of the community is around that, then you can make that linkage and say, well, that's what we're wanting to do with our building materials and the way that we're designing uh, the use of the land and the way that we're going to be using appropriate technologies for um, you know, power, solar, water, et cetera. You could say, well, this has a, um, you, know, you can get some maths around it, you know, so much of carbon neutrality or sequestration. And this meets your goal in the region where we have a, um, a target of 2025 to achieve this much carbon um, you know, reduction. You know, doing something like that, advocating um, at that level, then you could actually find a many different social benefits uh, that the community could achieve and maybe then bargain with the council for a relaxation of um, taxes, of fees, development levies, um, or even um, perhaps uh, the donation of the land or a portion of the land. Mm. I mean, there's, there's a church in uh, Ruakaka that has so much land around it. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering whether it's worth appealing to them for um, giving up some of their land for the social benefits for the community around there and maybe to make people go to church more, I don't know. <laughs> be seen to be good. Yeah, I think that's definitely... Um there was an article in the paper recently about churches having a lot of land and sort of that, you know, what, what should they be doing with it and housing being one of those that perhaps they're getting a bit pressured to be able to release the land or, you know, subsidize the housing on the land. So, yeah, I think looking to see where there could be that kind of a partnership um, as well. Yeah, definitely. I think the partnership approach uh, coming, um, from, from that angle of collaboration and partnership is really the way, because it's not a typical developer. They don't care about collaboration and partnership. That always makes things a bit more complex and messy, but uh, already with co-housing, there's a you know degree of complexity and it's very values based. So rather use uh, the positive nature of values based development and use it for you know, the purposes then of getting uh, partners on board impact investors, for instance, which can lend at a lower rate, um, grants and subsidies for various things on the, even on the site itself. And of course, partnering with a chip for some of those, the housing, the community housing providers looking at um, partnering with them to do maybe shared equity for some of the uh, residents. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and I and and there was that one slide. Did you want to go to that slide, Peter? I'll just show. Um, it's more around the design, uh, uh, the structural design, although it has some social design, also sort of structural social, uh, in terms of some cost savings. So if you were to show either council or others in the community, um, so I don't know if you're able to share that fully and do full share screen because I have. Let me see here. View. Is that not full? I hear. I don't know. It says standard. There we go. I've just made it a bit more full, at least on my screen anyway. Maybe it was my own screen. <laughs> but yeah, so this is what I made um, in terms of thinking about how to design in. And this is a lot of it co-housing related where um, you've got like food, for instance, you can save on food costs if you have built in uh, food gardens with herbs and vegetables and fruit and nut trees, then you get your food locally that way. Um, heating and cooling, obviously north facing and more green spaces allows for more cooling as well. Um, the elder and child care, that's one thing that quite often we don't really necessarily think about, although those with small children that have to juggle children, this would very much speak to their savings, which would be that the common spaces allow for the these children and elders to be cared for either in structured or non-structured ways, 
So there's a re reciprocity. So it could be that, you know, children spend time with the elders or, you know, there's activities that are for both of them that they can do in, in the common spaces where they don't need to hire somebody extra. So that, that's a social and a, a, you know, you have to obviously have the structure to be, be um, accommodating that as well. And then, you know, cost and health, if you were to actually cost up how much people would save over time in their health costs, it's a little bit hard to gauge, but I, I do know it, it must be more healthy to live in an environment where, you know, there's no, not much isolation and you have better food that's uh, around you and your house is made out of uh, non-toxic materials. Um, and then the consumption of goods and services. So the other thing that co-housing uh, really can build in is how much can we share that is going to help us with uh, sharing cars, sharing uh, bulk buying, um, as Peter said, electricity uh, coming in, uh, internet, internet line. Um, so there's so many things that can be in, in the consumption part ongoing. So a lot of this is affordability rather than a, only at the beginning part, it's a, these are kind of like ongoing, I guess, affordability features that can be spoken to. And some of it has uh, consequences on the council. So for instance, under water, where the council quite often would maybe cost what they consider to be their cost to, that's that development levy thing where they're like, well, we'll have to provide a certain amount of infrastructure and therefore you, you owe us this money. And you say, well, actually, we don't want your big uh, water pipes. We've got our own uh, localized water system. It can be a, sometimes a bit difficult to advocate for, but it can be done. And where you're, you know, having a local water system and saving again on that infrastructure cost. Obviously, the roading, uh, you know, co-housing is really great at that, keeping the roading to the minimum that's inside the um, inside the community itself. I didn't even put that in there, but that's a big one. In fact, not having uh, driveways to everybody's house is big yeah. savings. Yeah, I've just uh, on the um, subject of the water, uh, I mean, depending how kind of willing and brave the members of the co-housing are, if they deal with their own waste and you don't need to connect to the town sewer system or water system, that's going to save you um, a lot of money per year as well. Um, and also initially, I think it's twelve, fifteen thousand dollars or something like that per unit um, to connect up. Mm -hmm. But obviously you've got to balance that against um, your maintenance costs of having your own system or your composting toilet system and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything has to be considered long term, you know. The more insulation you put into the house, um, it's going to cost a bit more, but it's going to reduce the heating and cooling bills, uh, which are the most um, expensive of all your energy needs, of all your kind of, your power is mainly heating and cooling. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question um, that Ali had. It says, I'm curious if anyone has thoughts on community land trusts as a vehicle for purchasing land below market and then holding it in perpetuity for affordable housing. So that's a fantastic question. So we, I'll just cover that um, as much as I know about it. So a community land trust is a nonprofit entity that's set up for holding of land and it's got um, a board. So it has a, a trust deed and um, then a board governing. So that can be set up in any area. And then the community land trust can negotiate to hold that land. So that land, because it's a nonprofit, perhaps is more interesting for a uh, either a philanthropist or uh, for council to want to give that land to a housing trust rather because that stays in ownership for the community in perpetuity. And then the added bonus um, it, in terms of long-term affordability. So that means that the trust has an ongoing relationship with the houses that are on that trust. And so usually in the case of a house being on a trust, it is uh, the trust becomes a third party. Um, so they're sort of the intermediary between the person who is in the house and, um, and the trust itself. And or the bank, sorry, and the bank that, that makes the, the loan. 
and they can then put a cap on the resale of the house. So the house price only goes up according to the cost of living. Usually that's the formula plus any additions. So it has a long-term affordability piece where uh, subsequent owners, if one sells out and then the new um, owners come in, they're only buying it at the price where the cost of living has risen rather than on the market uh, rise in value. So the only thing people say about that is because in this country, we don't really have um, many community land, we have housing trusts and we only have one community land trust and there's only one set up that hasn't even gotten yet any houses <laughs> built yet. So the big question comes is, okay, that's well and good to get in at an affordable rate where the community land trust can negotiate like a chip, the subsidy or shared equity. And it's all great that I'm not paying for the house and the land, I'm only paying for the house. So in some cases, if the land is considered two thirds of the cost, then you get a house for a third of the cost. All that sounds great, but people say, well, what about when I leave? So if I'm only getting what is the uh, cost of living uh, added into the sale price, then that means, I, how can I buy into the market after I leave the community land trust? So two things around that. A community land trust is really meant for people who want to stay in place. So it's not meant for transient uh, people. So in a community, you usually have generations of people who've lived there, who want to stay there, who see their work and their life there. So the community land trust is primarily to keep people in place rather than getting moved out through gentrification. So that doesn't mean as much uh, to people who want to stay where they are. So in that case, community land trust is wonderful. And the second is that quite often a community land, um, a house would be for, let's say, a family who has children. And when the, uh, the house can be left to the children so that it can be passed along, or if the children move out, leaving um, you know, empty nesters, it could be that the empty nesters just one are ready to downsize. So the two children have moved out. They don't need a three bedroom. They just need a one bedroom and therefore their housing um, topology has changed and they don't need to be looking for the price of a three bedroom. They're only looking for a one bedroom, which would be less. And it might actually match that which they would get out from the three bedroom of the land trust. So that's the other thing that I say is that Really, it's a very long term solution. So it's not a get in and, oh, I got, you know, I only want to be here for a couple of years, then don't choose the, the land trust. But it's there's plenty of people that are in a community that want to stay. And that's where it works really well for, for those kinds of people. Yeah, were there any other questions around uh, any of the parts of the affordability or if anybody would like to share anything that they know that is another way to add affordability or a project that you're working on where you've um, got affordability questions? Happy to take more questions. Or happy to hear about just people's projects in general, like what are you working on? That might be quite interesting to hear the kinds of projects or why, even if you want to share what brings you here today, what is, <laughs> what's your uh, motive uh, for coming? Love to hear from anyone. You're all in the, behind uh, your, <laughs> your um, no video. So maybe if you want to bring yourself onto video, uh, so that we can see who you are and have a bit of a discussion. I think we need to stop the, the sharing so we can see each other. Okay, I'll oh, stop yes, the sharing. Oh, yes, let me do that. Good oh, idea. Very good. That's better. Yeah, that we have oh, better. Oh, people. <laughs> <laughs> So some of you I haven't met before, um, I don't think. Maybe, uh, sorry if I have met you and I don't recognize your name or your face. There's uh, Sam, Mark, Laura, Ali. I haven't met you before. And Casey, any of you would like to share what brings you here today? Or what stage you're at with the co-housing development? Mm -hmm. Well, I can talk about one thing that's happening here. I mean, in Nelson, there's 
quite a lot of um, little initiatives started up and our council is just going for an intensification of the town of Nelson, which is a good move. And we are sort of promoting social housing, mixed kind of models of co-housing for right in town and up above the shops. But another little interesting thing that we're doing here is starting something called, we, we, we realise that, you know, there's a lot of existing housing um, that isn't being utilised to the best of that it could be. For instance, you've got an old older person living in a great big house rattling around on a big property. And so we've started this, this is just one idea we've had. We've started this um, website called Co-Home for Her. And it's sort of like a dating service, if you like, a match, a matching service for people who have existing properties, homes. Um, so, for instance, it could be an older woman who's on her own. She's got a big property and she finds a match with a younger woman who maybe has a child and they can share the property and um, help each other out, basically, and have some company because as we know since COVID in particular, there's a lot of lonely people out there living in quite isolated lives. So um, that's just one little thought we thought we could get on with because for us, just even finding land around here is oh, everything's so landlocked and the developers have anything that's it. You know, one thing we are looking at was the land at the moment. Um, we've, we've found the registry of it and we're finding out where, because they've got massive amounts of land, especially the like the Catholic and the Church of England. They have land all over the show and often with dilapidated old, old buildings on it. So we're actually gone looking for that land and we're approaching the churches and saying, hey, do you want to do some social good here rather than sitting on these properties that, you know, are worth money and something people could do with? So that's just a couple of ideas of things we're doing in Nelson here at the moment. That sounds great, uh, Martine, and that um, reminds me of some developments they're doing in Europe where young people get free accommodation if they live with an old person. So mm. obviously the benefit for the young person is free accommodation and um, they have to put in some time to, you know, socialise with the, the old, uh, the senior. But it works really well, that model. And um, Yeah, you know, I read something it. about that. And yeah. it sounds like it's very beneficial for both people. You know, even the young ones are saying, hey, you know, getting to know these older people has just changed their lives, you know, and made it more meaningful. So I think it's, that's yeah. really great. There's, there's so many benefits, isn't there? The, um, mm. the transition of knowledge from the older to the younger and, and so on. And I yes. think that can be extended too with people with um, mild dementia and so on, which is a, a growing pandemic, mm. if I'm allowed to use that word, in our society. You know, it's, it's the biggest kind of health um, sector that's uh, developing in the West. So, mm. yeah, you know, sharing houses with people who have those sort of needs. It's a great initiative. And how did you get on with the church? Have you actually had any favourable responses? It's very interesting dealing with the church because I forget what it's called. They've gone from um, not needing to be of service. I forget what the term is, but it's kind of a nice out that says they're no longer responsibility for the social welfare of people. Um, so we're pushing our sort of conservative Church of England people here, and we just it's about doing it in the right way. You know, there's a lot of moneyed church people around Nelson and. Um, you know, they've got the market sort of tied up, but if we can play on their social consciences a bit, you know, um, in terms of them just sharing it around a little bit. So, so yeah, we're working through a bit of a process. I, I'm not actually directly involved with that one, so I can't really tell you much about it, but I think it's definitely about having someone who's that you've got a connection with who's actually in the system itself or on the board or somehow. Yeah, yeah nepotism, I can imagine. Well, good luck with yeah. that. We haven't got yeah. very far with it in Waipu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else got any? Um... I was just going to say, I'm like super interested in doing it in Auckland, but I find it like overwhelming uh, because of the land value here. And I also don't quite understand how in a society where like housing is such a commodity, 
that how do you get people to buy into community, I mean, co-housing, when like, for example, it might be a difference of putting $800,000 down versus a million dollars if you went into the normal market, but like you're, you're getting your mortgage up to your brain so much that you're taking a risk. It's not like you're just putting enough down and it's like affordable. You're going to be mortgaged up to your brains and then you're taking the risk that it's not going to grow as much as the market. And I just don't know how you upscale that. When like we're not talking about small mortgages being taken out to join a co-housing group. Yeah, no, it is tricky. I mean, there are huge sections in auction, in Auckland. I mean, I suppose it's a matter of finding a kind of dilapidated old house um, in the fringe somewhere and moving it off and then cutting it up into five sections. So, you know, where you've got one piece of land for one house, you could put four or five townhouses or apartments on there. So it's an intensification um, of the urban environment, which I think the council are encouraging people to do. Um, and that might be a way of, of reducing, or definitely would be a way of re reducing the, um, the outlay. But I know it's a, it's tough in New Zealand. You know, it's we've got it all wrong, really, and it's a fundamental human right that has turned into a way of gaining wealth. I mean, those two things should be separated. But what can we do? Mm. Well, we got to band together. That's what we can do, Peter. We got to <laughs> we got to form our own narrative and create our own, um, you know, tribe of folks who are willing to speak up and um, hold them to account. I mean, and, and you know, can also put it to them to the government who has a lot of the control over how how much money is charged and. Um, how much money can be available is that, you know, there's looking at how much money the government doesn't take from not charging capital gains. It's something like $24 billion or some crazy number like that, that's just head blowing. And you're thinking, what? Like the government's actually not taking this money that in most other countries around the world, equivalent to New Zealand, they, the government is taking that money. And then how much more could be done with it if that money was then uh, converted into supporting community-led housing? Yeah, I'm with you there. And this is the Labour government. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely nuts, isn't it? Apparently, the average national MP on average owns six houses or something like that. So I guess they're not going to be voting in capital gains tax either. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I mean, then there's, there is oh, there's a lot of yeah, go ahead. there is a lot of money around, so it is possible to you know appeal to um, people to invest in social um, social benefit projects. You know? So that's one way of of trying to um, get your co housing going in Auckland is to form a sort of community housing trust and appeal to some some big wigs or people with lots of money to do something beneficial. Can and I say again, something? Yeah, Sorry. please do. Um, because my idea of um, when it comes to this whole affordable, um, there will be a difference one day if you are um, the social housing thing. Like I choose not to work 40 hours a week and I choose not to um run the rat race and um, I do a lot of volunteering and I live in a tiny house so that's why I can choose not to work um, all the time at some point if you want to get into a social housing thing then you have to sort of this income tested stuff where's that line then are you actually um, I could say of course I'm not working um, full time because I have a child but I could potentially you see where the, where the dilemma then starts if we try to get to the affordability via the social housing 
extreme. Mm. That's what I'm mm. feeling I might be up against when um, we're trying to do the, our development, nothing planned, nothing, um, still trying to get a group together. But if you want to um, attract um, land, um, a donation of land or the whole um, philanthropic, then where's that line? I, am I really a social case? No, I'm not. I just choose to be. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was extraordinary, um, the Labour government's, what did they call it, uh, the bar that they set for um, a, getting, you know, well, um, social housing was so high. I mean, it was amazing, you know, two professional people uh, with an income of about 150000 could apply. So... They clearly don't really care about um, people living in tiny houses who are choosing not to be um, good consumers in the rat race. <laughs> yeah. So that's where, you, you know, you've got to try and band together with other people and form your own community housing uh, providing, providers. Yeah, and then yeah. I'll give a plug for inclusionary zoning because it is something that is uh, here in New Zealand that can be advocated for. Uh, the Queenstown Lakes Community Housing Trust, uh, the district um, helped to partner with the housing trust to make it, it basically law in the district that any developer who is um, getting a zoning change for turning land into a development has to give I think it's maybe 10% uh, to the housing trust and on that land, either on that exact piece of land that's uh, partitioned off the trust can build or the equivalent in how much that land is worth is given to the housing trust for the trust to buy land in another location because it might be that the developer has a certain house topology which goes above the cost of what the trust would like to build for. So in that case, then that's why the money would be given. But otherwise, the land is uh, available. And so that's how the Queenstown Lakes Community Housing Trust has been able to build. Um, I have a video on YouTube, actually, of uh, Julie, who's the CE, giving a presentation. So all the stats and the numbers are there. But something like 100 and something houses have been built um, and there's some a massive amount of money, uh, I want to say something like $25 million in their bank account because of that land acquisition through the inclusionary zoning. And that was with the district saying, this is the way we operate in this district. You know, if a developer wants land, you have to, you know, do this deal with the housing trust. And so that's a very powerful tool. And I don't know where else in the country it's being done. But that's where advocacy uh, comes in, where the I don't know who advocated to the district originally for that to be the case, but it's something that we have a precedent in this country. It's shown to have uh, fantastic benefits, housing so many people affordably. So any one person or any one group, I should say, in an area could advocate that inclusionary zoning. I know we were looking at it here in Hamilton. Uh, where I'm living currently, and they have brought the presentation here to the council to consider. I'm just not sure where they are in that uh, negotiation process, but uh, we have held council meetings on inclusionary zoning to bring it to our council to, to vote on. I think it's definitely the way New Zealand has to go because otherwise, for the most part, developers own all that land. How else are we gonna get a hold of any of it? So anyway, you can check out the presentation on um, YouTube. Uh, that's the Queenstown Lakes Community Housing Trust with Julie to just learn more about how they've done it over the last decade and, and where they're going forward with it. That's quite exciting. So I, I would like to wrap it up now uh, with uh, any last questions or comments that you have either telling us about your project or about any last uh, comments that you might have. Oh, I got another cat in the mix. I got my cat over here next to me as well. <laughs> Zoom well maybe I can. <laughs> yeah. I can share very briefly. Um, I'm creating uh, a project in Raglan, the Raglan uh, Eco Village, Regenerative Eco Village. And I just secured um, 23 uh, hectares of land on the outskirts of Raglan with quite a big price tag. 
And the uh, question is going to be really how we're going to uh, make it an, uh, an affordable uh, project. And that's going to be the question that's going to be raised soon as uh, we open the, uh, the project to the community in Redland at the end of September and creating a working group of people to uh, work on the feasibility study and make sure that uh, we can achieve this affordable uh, piece. Wow, that sounds great. Congratulations. Yeah, great so plug. And, and you even have a website started, Nadine. Yeah, it just started just today. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> don't know if you can find it on Google, but um, yeah, at some point I need to make that uh, available, Nadine, when you're ready to share that so everybody can find your Eco Village project and be very inspired and even, you know, be able to follow. You've got a little form where you're taking names and that way you can keep everybody up to speed. So that's what Nadine's done. She's got a website to be able to post how things are going so far and then taking names for people to be able to carry on um, with all the news and information that comes from that project with affordability being a big, a big uh, challenge, but yeah, that's, that's how we're able to. Uh, what, is the, what is the zoning of it, uh, Nadine? At the moment it's rural and I have, but I have presented the project to the council early July it was yeah. for another piece of land, but it was also rural, and they were uh, they were pretty open to the idea. I think they really liked the the two two different aspects they really liked was um, the affordable uh, housing piece and uh, the fact that we're going to try to work uh, to with a sustainable development goals and. Uh, and uh, the climate and with the climate uh, report action as well. So uh, trying to go as off-grid as possible. So I think they really liked the sustainable piece and the Waikato District Council uh, long-term policy is all about uh, uh, connected communities and sustainability. So what they said is we cannot not support your project, but yeah, but we are not going to unroll the red carpet for you because you don't fit into the boxes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So presumably at the moment, you're allowed to subdivide it down to 4,000 square metres. Is that right? At the moment, I'm not allowed to, to subdivide it at all. Oh, OK. Yeah. Because that's so we're a bit going, of an issue. Yeah. We're going to go and ask for resource consent. And uh, the question at the moment really is about working the land 10 years option and uh, what the council is going to allow us to do, what people will feel comfortable with, and what, what uh, land tenure banks will be happy to loan money, uh, money mm -hmm. to people. And we're going to certainly ask for land use consent, and maybe we're also looking at different maybe land tenure option, maybe partnering up with a social housing provider maybe as well. Um, there's lots of Lots of question and discussions also with um, different lawyers and uh, people who have worked with uh, intentional communities and what uh, land tenure can uh, work for people. Great. It's exciting. Well, well done. And, um, yeah, I hope you work it all out before, um, you know, it gets kind of too expensive. That's the question. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering, what's the definition of an eco village? Like, if people have to drive, if they're going to be dependent on a car, is like, what is the definition of eco? <laughs> I think oh, that's that, a good question, Ellie. Yeah. I actually have, um, I have made a YouTube video just for you on that. <laughs> so, if you go to the Common Ground YouTube channel, we actually did a whole hour and a half on eco village and what it is, how it's defined, what it is, what it's not. And we have lots of examples of eco villages in there. So I, I interview um, Rabina or Rabina McCurdy um, and uh, Ralph Wallace of the Lotus Eco Village. And then we have some international examples as well. So on there, you'll learn everything. So definitely go to the YouTube channel for Common Ground, subscribe. You'll see that um, video plus any others that come out. Plus this one, I'll put this um, video there too. But I think it's essentially it's a co-housing village 
that are made out of eco-friendly construction materials. Yeah. And well, you're it's, right. It's, uh, you it's driven by... To get there. Yeah, it's and it's working. driven by those dimensions of social, cultural, economic, and ecological design. And uh, there's also uh, principles that, so it's very much guided by principles rather than what it looks like. So one can have an eco village in Senegal, where there actually is a ministry for eco village development, where they basically upgrade and um, make traditional villages more eco and that can be called an eco village all the way to you know green fields development where it's all designed um, from scratch but it basically is the principles that guide that development uh, that actually one can say this is an eco village yeah and there is the global eco village network so that's another resource if you're really interested in eco villages uh, we have a um, region here called Genoa, so Global Eco Village Network, Oceania, Australasia. It's quite active. We're getting more active to be able to offer uh, workshops and be able to promote e eco village development here in our region. So I'm a uh, eco village ambassador, actually. So highly <laughs> recommend um, giving a plug for <laughs> the Global Eco Village Network. It's a great, yeah. It's a great kia ora, kia ora. I'm Julie. Uh, I do architecture. Ali, that's a really good point and a really valid point, and it's the number one um, thing on the top of the list when you're searching for a section. So, yeah, good on you. Mm. What is it to be to be able to? to what was the transport? To to, yeah, but the. The land, Access. the land is the land is placed so you can bike to, into Raglan. So uh, you can actually you don't have to use the car. You just have to have good legs. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and yeah. car share. You had you had thought also about car share mm -hmm. that kind of thing too. So mm -hmm. yeah, but thank you for mentioning it. Yeah, yeah, good, good, all good questions. Thank you. I appreciate you all showing up today and caring about co-housing, about um, you know sustainability, affordability, all the things that have come into our conversation today. Um, yeah, sign up for the Common Ground newsletter because this way you get to hear about, I'm hoping to have many more presenters on uh, topics that fall under this uh, large banner of you know regenerative housing. And if any of you have a particular um, project or an interest where you would like to use this platform, then I'd be happy to partner with you to uh, make another event for you to share. Cause that's what I did to Peter. I actually said, Hey, Peter, you did this thing. I think it's very relevant and please share it. And so it, it, we all have something I think to contribute. So I'm happy to partner. So thank you Good all you for coming right. today. Um, yes. Thanks. All right. Thanks. We'll, we'll say, uh, say goodbye and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Zola. Thank you, Peter, for sharing. Thank you. Bye. Good to see you. Thank you. Bye.